this city has not been always kind to the artist. It has probably its own reasons and its own interests and a society like anything else must cultivate. The arts must be cultivated just as you learn to read, as you learn to play an instrument. And Cork seems to have been a little too busy making money, but certainly very little money comes the artists' way in Cork. They have all, as a result, had to leave. Sean O'Fallon and uh, Frank O'Connor are two very good examples. They left when they were young, and one doesn't leave when one is as young as that without absolute frustration. There was no sort of climate there for them, and anybody who wrote books uh, was always suspected of being a sort of a nod, queer fella, not taken seriously. Frank O'Connor and O'Fallon always wrote about Cork in a sort of love-hate relationship. They have done a great deal to make the Cork that I knew alive. It's, it's come to life, I know it exactly. And uh, uh, sentence after sentence, walk after walk, down its various streets, looks at the buildings and the lee itself and the river and the atmosphere. It evokes the old city of Cork that I knew. Blarney Street, Mellow Lane, Shandon Street, all of the north side, various little streets and lanes tippling away down into the Lee, and the other ones going north up to Grana Brother. Cork Green is wonderful, Threshold of Quite evokes it too, especially the description of Stevie Galvin leaning over Parnell Bridge and thinking of his brother who was away in the Pine Star, wondering when she'd come home. All that mood is part of Cork. It's the quintessence of Cork, the Cork I knew, the Cork that made me, and the Cork I love. I came back from Paris in 1932. I had been there on a scholarship and uh, decided uh, to try and get some work around. J. A. O'Connell's, where I had served my apprenticeship, were very slack. There was no hope there, and uh, the whole building trade was at a standstill. Plasterers, masons, and carpenters, idle, walking the streets. It was the hungry thirties, no commissions, nothing doing. So I decided I'd have to do something about it and I courageously got over the wall and went into the next yard and set up business. I tried to do busts of my friends. Some of them I succeeded in doing, but uh, I was very conscious of making a sort of record of the people whom I thought were creative and who were almost as poor as myself at that time. I asked them to know where they sit for me. Most of them were very obliging indeed. The only trouble was that I built up a large gallery and they brought me in no money. So what I did then was to continue on with my stone carving and monumental work, and that provided the bread and butter. This head of Freddie May, I like very much. An extraordinary thing about it is that people tell me it's a self-portrait. I failed to see any resemblance between myself and Freddie, except that I had I had at one stage quite an affinity with him. He is an artist and he had all sorts of personal problems and trouble, especially with his music. And he wrote very fine music and had a good deal of stuff uh, performed in the BBC. This is one of my own favourites, Sean O'Rear Dawn. He has a very interesting head from a modelist's point of view, but he is also a most interesting man. He was a great challenge because he has a sort of scintillating, his mind is so fast and as soon as you're in a sort of contemplative mood, looking and trying to get at him, 
you get a, a flash from a dashboard and completely throw you off the job you were doing. So you had to get back again onto it and look then through him. And this is my effort at looking through Sean O'Hardaw, not looking at him. This, of course, is a head of Corkery, Daniel Corkery, a writer, professor, teacher. He uh, was my teacher at St. Patrick's National School. And to him, I would say that I owe everything in so far as he was the first person to make me aware of what art was and what, not what art was, he would never discuss art, but how important drawing was and how important painting was. And so that I went to the School of Art. From there, I was collected as a stone carver. The man himself uh, was very good because uh, I wasn't the only one that uh, Corky looked after. He looked after anybody that he felt had talent. The wonderful thing about this is that it wasn't self-conscious. You didn't feel that you were being directed in, into a road. All you knew was that you were given things you wanted to do. The same would stand for Frank O'Connor, I think. He had a great brain and he was an artist also, but without being a poor boy, as he explains himself in An Only Child, he wouldn't have had a book, no one to direct his reading, and Corkery gave him the right books to read. I think that was a great help to any young person struggling like that. Sean O'Fellon did not come under Corkery's influence as much or anything like O'Connor's because he had the advantages of a secondary education, while O'Connor was regarded as being unfit for a secondary education. O'Fellon got him from secondary school to college, but he was a real scholar and he still has a scholar's mind. And I think he's done a tremendous job for Ireland when he produced the magazine called The Bell. John Joe McCarthy, a stonecutter, out of a dynasty of stonecutters. He is a subject for James Joyce. I couldn't attempt to say anything like what one could say about him. He was a violent man, not at peace with himself or anyone else. He went off in the First War, joined the Munster Fusiliers, and served right through it and came back and went back to stone cutting. He was a good craftsman, but he had this thing in his nature. What you'd say, I suppose, if there wasn't a row there, there was a makings of a row when he arrived. <laughs> well, he'd be what my father would call a liberty farmer. Outside the liberty is a cork. There were certain rights and certain Jews and so on. Well, the liberty farmers were notoriously mean. If they gave a penny going into a church, they wait patiently for the halfpenny change. But he wasn't that sort of a man himself, but he was surrounded by people like that. He's the sort of man that created the Land League, beat the evictions. He stayed there rooted and nothing could shift him. Acts of Parliament, governments or armies wouldn't shift that man. And in that way, he's terribly important. He's the story of Ireland. He's the, he's the, the, the sort of solid thing. I thought of him in that way, and that's why I sort of carved it that way, by leaving the big sort of rough base there, and he just planted in it an integral part of it. This head here is my father, or at least my father as I saw him, which is the great problem with that head because I was uh, still looking at him looking at him in the sense I was trying to understand him more so than, than looking at him. That is one of the things about modelling. Um, there's no good in setting up somebody there and saying, I'm going to do a head of this person. Unless there's communication on the other side, that subject is going to inform you by a look, a gaze, a manner, you have nothing to go on. I mean, the physical thing is, is the thing you do with your hands, you get the clay together, knead it, put it up. But what you really want is some sort of feeling, some sort of connection between you and the sitter. And if, you, if that comes off at any stage, well, then the work is great pleasure and uh, it's usually good. It takes two people, I often said, to make uh, a bust, the sitter and the sculptor.